VOA1 The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from The Voice of America. I'm Pete Musto. And I'm Dorothy Gundy. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear stories from Ana Mateo and Alice Bryant. Later, we present a classic American story by O. Henry, originally adapted and recorded by the U.S. State Department. But first, this report from Jill Robbins. This week, we answer a question from Noel from France. He writes, Can you explain the difference between matter, problem, and issue? In English lessons, these three words come often in the conversation, and I am never sure which I have to use. Thank you in advance for the explanation, and thank you very much for the daily news and lessons. Noel, France Dear Noel, As a learner of English, you probably wonder, why does the language have so many words with similar meanings? One reason is that some words are more common in formal or official settings than others. Let me start with problem, the least formal of the words that you asked about. Problem is a word that you can use in many different situations. A problem is a difficulty to overcome or a question to solve. We may say, for example, the poor economy has caused social problems. Or you could ask somebody this question if they look unhappy. What's the problem? There are many words that are close in meaning to problem, such as trouble or challenge. A more formal word that sometimes has the same meaning as problem is issue. It can mean a topic or subject. At meetings, Issue is used for an important problem that people debate or talk about. You may hear political candidates use this word as in this example. My opponent does not make clear statements on the issues. We can also use issue to talk about things that a large number of people care about. For example, Ocean scientists spoke on the environmental issue of plastic pollution. Matter is a more formal way of saying topic or material. The word matter can have a more neutral or a positive meaning than problem or issue, as in, we will discuss the matter of awards in the next meeting. However, matter is also an informal way of saying problem when we ask a question like, what's the matter? When you are trying to decide which of the three words to use, ask yourself, how formal is this situation? If it is informal, then use the word problem. When talking about a political subject or a debate topic, you may use the word issue. If the situation is more formal or a legal discussion, or you are talking about something that is not a problem, use the word matter. And that is Ask a Teacher for this week. What question do you have about English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. I'm Jill Robbins. To stay safe during the coronavirus pandemic, we have had to sacrifice many things we enjoy, including physical contact with others. 
Gone are handshakes, kisses, and hugs. Research has shown that humans need physical touch to stay mentally and physically healthy. Without it, many become lonely, sad, and even sick. So if you feel you need a hug, we know something you can safely put your arms around and hold close. A tree. Tree hugging may sound a little strange, but humans have practiced forms of nature therapy for years. The Japanese practice of Shinrin Yoku is an example. Shinrin means forest in Japanese, and Yoku is the Japanese word for bath. But no soap or water is needed for Shinrin Yoku. All that nature bathing requires is spending time in nature, listening to its sounds, breathing in its scent, connecting to its life force. Recently, Israel has been promoting tree hugging on social media. The country's Nature and Parks Agency is behind the public health campaign. Orit Steinfeld is marketing director for Israel's Apollonia National Park. In this unpleasant corona period, she said, we recommend to people around the world to go out to nature, take a deep breath, hug a tree, express your love, and get love. The park is about 15 kilometers north of Tel Aviv. Inside the park, some visitors observed the officials' advice and hugged trees. Barbara Grant was one of them. The most basic human need, she said, is for connection, for touching, for hugging. Visitor Moshe Hazan told Reuters he came to the park to hug a tree. We are not hugging too many people these days. Hugging a tree is quite a nice thing to do. In May, the coronavirus spread slowed in Israel. However, case numbers increased there in recent weeks. In response, the country renewed many COVID-19 restrictions. Israel's tree-hugging campaign is not the first of the pandemic. Iceland's Forest Service launched a similar effort in April. They advised everyone in the country to hug a tree for at least five minutes every day. The Reuters news agency shared a short video showing people in Iceland hugging trees in the forest. Park officials also cleared paths in the woods so that visitors could socially distance while they searched for that special tree. There are plenty of trees, said a forest worker in the video. No need for everyone to hug the same tree. The story on Iceland's tree-hugging campaign was also reported on treehugger.com. Naturally. I'm Ana Mateo. As pressure grows for teachers to return to their classrooms this fall, concerns about coronavirus risks are pushing many away. Some are finding other jobs, while others are mobilizing in an effort to delay the reopening of schools. Among those choosing early retirement is Liza McArdle, she is a 50-year-old high school language teacher in New Boston, Michigan. She thought about the health risks and other issues, such as trying to teach French and Spanish while wearing a face covering. 
She also thought about how she might have to teach students online and decided it was time to go. We're always expected to give, give, give. You're a teacher. You have to be there for the kids, McArdle said. She said now teachers are being asked to risk their lives because children need to be in school. Teachers' unions have begun pushing back against what they consider unnecessarily fast reopening plans. The largest unions say reopening should depend on whether school districts have the ability and money to enforce rules that keep students and teachers safe. On Monday, a teachers' union launched a legal case to block the reopening of schools in Florida. State officials said school districts should reopen schools unless local health officials decide it is unsafe. Teachers in several U.S. cities have called for the school year to start with online classes. Some have joined protests in Arizona. Three teachers in the state who shared a classroom during summer school got infected with the virus. One of them reportedly died. Regina Fuentes is a high school teacher in Columbus, Ohio. She told the Associated Press that teachers and students shouldn't have to go back to school just to save the economy. Fuentes is entering her 22nd year of teaching. American Federation of Teachers President Randy Weingarten said her union is pushing for safety in reopening schools, but she has not ruled out the possibility of strikes. A recent study from the nonprofit group Kaiser Family Foundation examined the health of teachers. It found that nearly 25% of the nation's teachers are at a higher risk of serious illness from the coronavirus because of health conditions or age. That is nearly 1.5 million teachers. A survey by the Michigan Education Association last month asked about 15,000 teachers about their plans. 23% said they were considering retiring early or leaving their jobs because of COVID-19. 7% said they plan to leave. Not all teachers are concerned. Karen Tenyus said she would love to restart face-to-face -face lessons with her young students in Orlando, Florida. She disagrees with people who say it is not safe. Even as cases sharply rose in the state, Tenyus, who is 60, said she has not been covering her face and is not worried about getting COVID-19. It really has become a political issue which really bothers me, Tenyus said. But school reopening plans could get a lot more difficult if large numbers of teachers leave. Mary Morris has been teaching for 30 years in Toledo, Ohio. She will not return this fall to the Catholic school where she teaches. A temporary change to online learning this spring caused her to cry. But at that time, she still decided to stay another year. Then she tried to start planning for kindergarten lessons. The new virus safety rules include keep children separated, do not share playthings, continuously clean all objects used to teach counting. Everything that I believe in, I can't do, Morris said. It's all going to be paper and pencil. And that's when I sat down and I thought, 
What am I doing? Other teachers feel their only choice is to stay. Retiring now is not financially possible for Deb Waddle, a 61-year-old science teacher who misses her students. But she worries. She and her close family have health conditions that put them at a higher risk than healthy people. She is hoping to get an online teaching position for her rural district in Columbia, Kentucky. Waddle said she has spent part of her summer working on changes to her classroom lessons. And she got surplus masks. But she is not happy thinking about wearing one all day in a room where the heating and cooling system is, she said, older than her. She also ordered clear eye coverings to help her avoid touching her eyes, which dry out because of a health condition. David Kitzman teaches wood and metalwork at a high school in Minnetonka, Minnesota. Kitzman, who is 61, said explaining his own higher risk to students could help push them to keep wearing masks, washing their hands, and social distancing. He said he would hate to see any of the students or teachers die from the virus. And if we're smart, we don't have to. I'm Alice Bryant. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites. The World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Mammon and the Archer Old Anthony Rockwall, who made millions of dollars by making and selling Rockwall soap, stood at the window of his large Fifth Avenue house. He was looking out at his neighbor, G. Van Shulite Suffolk Jones. His neighbor is a proud member of a proud old New York family. He came out of his door and got into a cab. He looked once, quickly as usual, at Anthony Rockwall's house. The look showed that Suffolk Jones was a very important man, while a rich soap maker was nothing. I will have this house painted red, white, and blue next summer, said the soap king to himself, and we'll see how he likes that. And then Anthony Rockwall turned around and shouted, Mike! in a loud voice. He never used a bell to call a servant. Tell my son, he said when the servant came, to come to me before he leaves the house. When young Rockwall entered the room, the old man put down the newspaper he'd been reading. Richard, said Anthony Rockwall, what do you pay for the soap that you use? Richard had finished college six months before, and he had come home to live. He had not yet learned to understand his father. He was always being surprised. He said, six dollars for twelve pieces. And your clothes? About sixty dollars, usually. You are a gentleman, said his father. I have heard of young men who pay twenty-four dollars for twelve pieces of soap, and more than a hundred for clothes. You have as much money to throw away as anyone else has, but what you do is reasonable. I myself use Rockwall soap because it is the best. When you pay more than ten cents for a piece of soap, you're paying for a sweet, strong smell and a name. But fifty cents is good for a young man like you. 
You are a gentleman. People say that if a man is not a gentleman, his son can't be a gentleman. But perhaps his son's son will be a gentleman. But they're wrong. Money does it faster than that. Money has made you a gentleman. It has almost made me a gentleman. I've become very much like the two gentlemen who own the houses on each side of us. My manners are now almost as bad as theirs. But they still can't sleep at night because a soap maker lives in this house. <laughs> there are some things that money can't do, said the young man rather sadly. Don't say that, said old Anthony. Money is successful every time. I don't know anything you can't buy with it. Tell me something that money can't buy. And I want you to tell me something more. Something is wrong with you. I've seen it for two weeks. Tell me. Let me help you. In 24 hours, I could have $11 million here in my hands. Are you sick? Some people call it a sickness. Oh, said Anthony. What's her name? Why don't you ask her to marry you? She would be glad to do it. You have money, you're good-looking, and you are a good boy. Your hands are clean. You have no rock wall soap on them. I haven't had a chance to ask her, said Richard. Make a chance, said Anthony. Take her for a walk in the park or walk home with her from church. You don't know the life of a rich girl, father. Every hour and minute of her time is planned. I must have her or the world is worth nothing to me. And I can't write to say I love her. I can't do that. Do you tell me, said the old man, that with all my money you can't get an hour or two of a girl's time? I've waited too long. She's going to Europe the day after tomorrow. She's going to be there two years. I'm allowed to see her alone tomorrow evening for a few minutes. She's coming to the city on a train. I'm going to meet her with a cab. Then we'll drive fast to the theater where she must meet her mother and some other people. <sighs> Do you think she would listen to me then? No. Or in the theater? No. Or after the theater? No. No, father, this is one trouble that your money can't help. We can't buy one minute of time with money. If we could, rich people would live longer. There is no hope of talking with Miss Lantry before she sails. Richard, my boy, said old Anthony, I'm glad you're not really sick. You say money won't buy time? Perhaps it won't buy all of time, but I've seen it buy some little pieces. That evening his sister, Ellen, came to Anthony to talk about the troubles that lovers have. He told me all about it said Brother Anthony. I told him he could have all the money he wanted. Then he began to say that money was no use to him. He said money couldn't help him. Oh, Anthony, said Ellen, I wish you wouldn't think so much of money. Money is no help for love. Love is all-powerful. If he had only spoken to her earlier, she could never say no to our Richard. But now I fear it is too late. All your gold cannot buy happiness for your son. At eight the next evening, Ellen took an old gold ring and gave it to Richard. Wear it tonight, she said. Your mother gave it to me. She asked me to give it to you when you had found the girl you loved. Young Rockwall took the ring and tried to put it on his little finger. It was too small. He put it inside his coat in a place where he thought it would be safe. And then he called for his cab. At the station, he met Miss Lantry. We must not keep my mother and the others waiting, said she. To Wallach's Theatre, as fast as you can drive, said Richard to the cabbie. They rolled along 42nd Street to Broadway and from there to 34th Street. Then young Richard quickly ordered the cabbie to stop. I've dropped the ring, he said, getting out. It was my mother's, and I don't want to lose it. This will only take a minute. I saw where it fell. 
In less than a minute, he was again in the cab with the ring. But within that minute, a wagon had stopped in front of the cab. The cabbie tried to pass it on the left, but a cab was there. He tried to pass on the right, but another cab was there. He could not go back. He was caught where he was and could not move in any direction. These sudden stops of movement will happen in the city. Instead of moving along the street in their usual orderly way, all the wagons and cabs will suddenly be mixed together and stopped. Why don't you drive further? said Miss Lantry. We'll be late. Richard stood up in the cab and looked around. He saw a stream of cabs and wagons and everything else on wheels rolling toward the corner where Broadway, 6th Avenue, and 34th Street meet. They came from all directions, and more and more were rolling toward them. More and more were caught there. Drivers and cabbies shouted. Everyone on wheels in New York City seemed to be hurrying to this place. I'm very sorry, said Richard. He sat down again. We can't move. They won't get this straight for an hour. If I hadn't dropped the ring, we... Let me see the ring, said Miss Lantry. Since we really can't hurry, I don't care. I didn't want to go to the theatre. I don't like the theatre. At eleven that night, someone stopped at the door of Anthony's room. Come in, shouted Anthony. He had been reading and put down his book. It was Ellen. They are going to be married, Anthony, she said. She has promised to marry our Richard. On their way to the theater, their cab was stopped in the street. It was two hours before they could move again. Oh, brother Anthony, don't ever talk about the power of money again. It was a little ring, a true love ring, that was the cause of our Richard finding his happiness. He dropped it on the street and had to get out and find it. And before they could continue, the cab was caught among the others. He told her of his love there in the cab. Money is nothing, Anthony. True love is everything. I'm glad the boy got what he wanted, said old Anthony. I told him I didn't care how much money. But, brother Anthony, what could your money do? Sister, said Anthony Rockwell, I'm reading a book with a good story in it. It's a wild adventure story, but I like it, and I want to find what happens next. I wish you would let me go on reading. The story should end there. I wish it would. I'm sure you, too, wish it would end there. But we must go on to the truth. The next day, a person with red hands and a blue necktie whose name was Kelly came to Anthony Rockwall's house to see Anthony. That was good soap we made, said Anthony. I gave you $5,000 yesterday. I paid out $300 more of my own money, said Kelly. It cost more than I expected. I got the cabs, most of them for $5, but anything with two horses was $10. I had to pay most to the cops. $50 I paid to two, and the others 20 and 25 But didn't it work beautifully, Mr. Rockwall? They were all on time, and it was two hours before anyone could move. Thirteen hundred. There you are, Kelly, said Anthony, giving him the money. A thousand for you, and the three hundred of your own money that you had to spend. You like money, do you, Kelly? I do, said Kelly. Anthony stopped Kelly when he was at the door. Did you see, asked he, anywhere on the street yesterday, a little fat boy with no clothes on? Carrying arrows? Kelly looked surprised. No, I didn't. But if he was like that with no clothes, perhaps the cops caught him. <laughs> I thought Cupid wouldn't be there, Anthony said, laughing. Goodbye, Kelly. <laughs>